Okay, welcome everyone to the second lecture on BC213, the end times. Um, we are considering reasons as to why we are, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And so we are looking at um, Bible reasons for that. We've looked at three. First, we said because of uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, where Paul very clearly says that um, there is something that's restraining the Antichrist, the man of sin, from being revealed. And until that is taken out of the way, he will not be revealed. And so we ask the question, you know, who is that? Uh, is it the Holy Spirit? Is it the church? And our conclusion was that uh, this has to refer to the church, and we gave reasons why, uh, clearly indicating, gave you several reasons that, um, that the Bible clearly shows that the Holy Spirit will be working on the earth through the tribulation. The second reason we said was because Paul, in his writing to the Thessalonians, first and second Thessalonians, uh, in both of these episodes, there's a lot of teaching about the coming of, of the Lord. Uh, it seems to be one of the main themes in his epistles to the Thessalonians. And um, in the context of that, the coming of the Lord, which Paul clearly, he demarcates two experiences. One is the Lord coming for us and we're meeting him in the air. Another, the Lord coming with us, but we are executing judge, but the Lord is executing judgment on the earth. So there are two different events in the coming of the Lord, in the day of the Lord. And in the context of this, he says, you know, the coming of the Lord is going to result in our salvation from the judgment to come, from the day of wrath, from the wrath to come. So we say, okay, let's put it in context. And therefore, we say, it's clearly our salvation, our deliverance from the seven years of judgment poured out on the earth. The third reason we gave, which we saw, is from Revelation chapter 3, uh, where the Lord Jesus says clearly to the church in Philadelphia, He says, you know, I will keep you from the trial that's going to come upon the whole earth. So in the context of the book of Revelation, in which these words are given, the seven years of tribulation are the, is the trial that is to come upon the whole earth. And he says very clearly, I'll keep you from it. Okay, three reasons. Let's move forward. Any questions on those first three reasons? Okay. So. Let's move forward, look at another three reasons why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Number four, because of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. And of course, this is repeated you know, in, in, in the other gospels, but we're just looking at Matthew 24. And Jesus, he, he gives an exhortation to believers. And then he uses the typology uh, of uh, the days of Nova and the Ark. Right. So in Matthew 24, when we went through this chapter uh, a little earlier in this course, uh, we broke it down. We said there are signs that lead up to the tribulation. Then there is the tribulation period, Matthew 24, 15 to 19. Then there is the second coming, the gathering of the tribulation saints and the battle of Armageddon. Then the rest of the chapter is an exhortation to the church, to believers to always be ready. So this rapture must take place somewhere here, right? The, between Matthew 24, 14 and Matthew 24, 15, the rapture must take place somewhere here. Because in Matthew 24, 15 is, is the beginning of the end. Now, while the Lord is exhorting, giving us you know this teaching of the end times, he then points back to the days of Noah. Uh, and he says in Matthew 24, 36 to 42, 
Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also would the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he's saying, look, there is a parallel here. There's a comparison here, a typology. So Noah was there. He was a preacher of righteousness. So he was, while he was getting the ark ready, he was preaching, telling the people, hey, there's a flood coming. It's judgment coming. But nobody paid attention. They were just continuing on with life, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until Noah and his family went into the ark. They were taken out of the place where judgment was going to be poured. And of course, there were the livestock, the animals that also went into the ark. So they went into the ark. Then judgment was poured out on the people who refused to hear the preaching of righteousness. Then when that judgment was over, Noah and his family came back on the earth. Now Jesus is saying, as in the days of Noah, they didn't know until the flood came, took them all away. That's how it's going to be at the end of times. That's leading up to the coming of the Son of Man, Son of God. So if you look at that typology, Noah and his family were taken out of the way, in a sense. Of course, I know the ark was floating on the water, so let's not argue about that. But the picture is Noah and his family were taken out of the way to a place of safety. While judgment was poured out, the flood came, destroyed the lives, and then they were released back on the earth. So going by that typology, it's a beautiful picture of the church being taken out of the way while the seven years of tribulation, judgment and wrath is being poured out on the earth. Then when that is over, the church comes back. It's a beautiful picture. So that's our fourth reason. Because Jesus pointed that and says, it's going to be like that before the coming of the Son of Man. Number five is because of the chronology of the book of Revelation. We are going to get into the book of Revelation uh, shortly, and uh, we're going to look at the, the whole sequence. But I'll just give you a little introduction now, and then we will get into the book chapter by chapter, an overview, right? Not verse by verse. In the third year, we will do verse by verse. But now, this, this, this course, we'll do an overview. But when you do an overview of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation, Jesus clearly says, you write the things you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place. Right? So he's telling John, Revelation 1.19, write the things which you have seen. So he wrote that in chapter 1. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, there were seven churches that were there at that time, he recorded that. And the things which will take place, chapter 4 to 22, out in the future. So the book of Revelation is broken into these three parts. Things that you have seen, chapter 1, he saw the vision of the Lord. Things which are, chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches. Things which will take place, chapter 4 to 22. Now, in chapter 4, John is caught up into the Spirit, and then he's giving a vision of the future. So everything from chapter 4, verse 2, is vision into the future. Chapter 4, verse 1, come into heaven, I'll give you a vision of the future. It doesn't mean those things were happening, 
but those were things that were going to happen. He's seeing into the future. And it's very clearly understandable. Chapters 4 and 5 is talking about believers who are in heaven. They're worshipping the throne of God. Where do they come from? That's the raptured church. You can see the elders sitting around the throne with their crowns. Crowns represent rewards, which we saw earlier. That means here are the believers who are sitting around the, the elders who have received their crowns. The believers are standing with their robes of righteousness, worshipping Jesus. So Revelation 4 and 5 is a picture of the raptured church worshipping Jesus. Revelation 6 through 19, most of it is talking about what the tribulation happening here on earth. Sometimes we go back into heaven and see what's happening in heaven, but we come back and say, this is what's happening on earth. That's Revelation 6 to 19. And that Revelation 19 ends with the Lord coming in vengeance, uh, uh, coming with the saints and with the angels of God to execute vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel. Right? That's Revelation 19. Then 21, 20, 21, 22, the millennium, the new heavens and the, new, the great white throne judgment, and new, heavens and new heavens and new earth, all in the future. So when you look at the chronology of the book of Revelation, it's very clear. The church is taken out of the way, and the tribulation happens without the church being here. But there are believers, people who will refuse the mark of the beast, refuse uh, people who will believe in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. So when you look at Revelation, it's very clear uh, in the sequence of events. The church is not here on the earth during the tribulation. Lastly, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, when the angel Gabriel came and spoke to Daniel and explained to him about his vision, he spoke to Daniel about 70 weeks. Now, each week represents a period of seven years. Now, that is in the Old Testament. Um, one cross references in, uh, you know, I think it's in. I'm going to just give it quickly here. In Genesis, um, um, Genesis 29, 27, uh, Genesis 29, 27, you'll find that one week represents a period of seven years in the Old Testament. That means they understood a week re to represent seven years. When Laban told Jacob, you need to work for a week for you to marry uh, Rebecca. The, uh, uh, the week represented seven years. It means you need to work another seven years you know, to marry his second daughter, Rachel, I think. Anyway, so. Rachel, yeah. So 70 weeks means 70 times 7. Each week represents 7 years. So he's talking about 490 years. And uh, these 490 years or 70 weeks are divided into 69 weeks plus one week. Right? Uh, I, I will explain, uh, we will study Daniel in detail later on. I'm just kind of explaining this very quickly. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That is, seven plus 62 is 69. 69 weeks from the time King Cyrus gave command to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, came, until Jesus came. So Daniel foretold 483 years, 69 weeks, 69 times 7, 483 years. That's exactly what happened. From the time King Cyrus said, the king of Persia, he said, go back, rebuild Jerusalem, till Jesus came, 483 years. But then there's one week left. That means one period of seven years. That is often referred to as Daniel's 70th week. Now, this entire 490 years 
is speaking very specifically about the Jewish people and Jerusalem. So Angel Gabriel told Daniel, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about 490 years, that is about your people, about your holy city, that's about, the, about Israel and Jerusalem. So the seven years that's left really is very specific about Israel and Jerusalem, not about the church. So when we go through the book of Revelation, read these, you know, what happens during that seven years of tribulation, you'll find a lot of it has to, of course, it's a global thing. That the judgment is being poured out on the whole earth. But there's also something very specific. It's about things happening in Israel and Jerusalem. The temple being desecrated. The two witnesses standing up in Jerusalem about the Antichrist setting himself as, a, as God and the temple of God. Uh, as the Antichrist going after Israel to destroy Israel. As all the nations gathering together against Israel. So the seven years, the Daniel 70th week, has to do with reference to Israel, not the church. So the seven years of tribulation, the church is out of the way. Because Angel Gabriel clearly said that these 70 years, 70 times 7, 490 years, this last, you know, that, that also refers to the last seven years, Daniel 70th week, is about the people of Israel and about the city of Jerusalem. And then he tells us, you know, what will happen here, that this man of sin, this Antichrist, for one week, that is for seven years, he's going to, you know, set up a covenant. Uh, and then in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years, he will he'll stop the sacrifice and offering and, and all of that. We will come back and I'll explain these verses in detail. But what I'm just pointing out is, that the seven years of tribulation is not about the church, but it's about Israel and Jerusalem, because that's Daniel's 70th week, right? So the church is out of the way. It's not the, the focus of the things happening in, tribu in the tribulation is all about Israel and Jerusalem, not focus on the church. So we have seen six reasons why we say the church is not here during the tribulation. The church has been raptured, it's taken out of the way, and is not going through the tribulation, but uh, the tribulation has to do with the judgment being poured out on the earth, and it also has to do with the Antichrist going after Israel very specifically. Any questions about these six reasons? Is it clear? Everybody's very quiet. Um, you should be able to give these six reasons if somebody asks you why do you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Uh, you should be able to explain, hey, these are reasons why I believe the church will not go through the tribulation. And of course, you know, show it biblically. Any questions? Okay. I'm going forward. So, in relation to the rapture and um, you know, uh, what is going to happen in heaven, so on. There are some common questions, and we're just addressing these common questions here. So one question that's often asked is, who will be raised up from the dead at the time of the rapture? Will we meet the Old Testament saints raised up in Ephesians 4? Now, remember that when Christ ascended, when the Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, when he ascended and went into heaven, the Old Testament saints, whose spirits were held in Abraham's bosom, they went up with him into heaven. Paradise 
was shifted, was relocated from being part of what we call as the, yeah, the, the, the place for the departed in the Old Testament. Paradise was taken from there from as a compartment from hell, Abraham's bosom. It was taken up into heaven. So in the New Testament, paradise is always seen in heaven, not down in uh, below the earth. So the Old Testament saints were taken there. Now, there is no indication that they were given glorified bodies, right? Uh, that they were they were they were taken up in heaven, they were raised up, and uh, uh, they were there. And the Bible says also in Hebrews eleven, you know, that we are going to be glorified together with them. Or we're going to experience this is Hebrews. Um, uh, 1140 that we are going to be made perfect together uh, not apart from us but together with us right? so that completion the great grand completion is going to happen together with us Hebrews 1140 so the Old Testament saints were taken up into heaven after the resurrection of Christ so where are the Old Testament saints they are up in heaven what will happen at the time of the rapture? At the time of the rapture, those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, will rise. And they will, when the dead are raised, that means those who have died in Christ are raised at the time of the rapture, we will receive our glorified bodies. Right? And uh, the Old Testament saints, we know, they, they believed in the resurrection, that they would be raised up. Uh, they, they they believed in all of this, right? And they were held in the this uh, Sheol, which was the Old Testament. They they were held here in Abraham's bosom when Christ was raised up from the dead. He led them into heaven. He transported them into the third heaven, and that's why paradise uh, you see in the New Testament is in heaven. So the spirits of the Old Testament saints are now with Christ, and um, they are uh, with Christ in heaven. Now, even the Old Testament saints are referred to; they are referred to as saints, right? They are they because they've been taken up with Christ. Right? So the big question is: When will they, the Old Testament saints, receive? Their bodies, glorified bodies. When will they get it? Now, what we can infer, in Paul says, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. God will bring with him those who are asleep. So that means they die in Christ, he'll bring with them. So when they die in Christ, they are there. And the Bible tells us, as a, re as a reference, Hebrews 11, that they, the Old Testament saints, should not be made perfect apart from us. Or, if you put it in another way, they will be made perfect together with us. The second thing we see is that the spirits of just men, this is in Hebrews 12, that these are people who are with the Lord. They are with the Lord. right? That means these Old Testament saints, they are with the Lord. So the, the spirits of those who die in Christ go up to be with the Lord. The spirits of all the Old Testament saints, they are already with Christ because he took them up into heaven. So we say, and, and a third reason, Paul also mentions, he talks about the whole family in heaven and earth. So who is that whole family? It includes the Old Testament saints, right? So there is a family of God which is in heaven, including Old Testament saints and New Testament saints who die in Christ. They're all in heaven. And then there is a family of God on earth, that is, we believers who are here on earth. So we can say that when Christ is coming and when Paul says, God will bring with him those who are asleep in Christ. Those God will bring with him 
who are who's there in heaven with him the spirits of just men the spirits of the old testament saints the spirit of the new testament saints they're all there with them so they will all come with him and receive their bodies at this time so who will all receive glorified bodies everybody who is with the lord in heaven miss the spirits of all the people who are in heaven and everybody those of us who are alive and remain at the coming of the lord in a moment in the twinkling of an eye our mortal will put on immortality so we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So every person, the spirit of every person who's with God in heaven and every believer here on earth, we will all be made perfect together, receiving our glorified bodies at that instant. We'll all be made perfect together and we caught up to be with the Lord in heaven okay so the answer to answer the question uh, who will receive glorified bodies at that time at the rapture every saint those who are in heaven those who are on earth receive their glorified bodies will we see the Old Testament saints at the time yeah they're already they're already in heaven the spirits of just men made perfect they're already there in heaven they've been made perfect and so they are there they're righteous in god and uh, we will meet them in heaven right so we'll meet everybody there in heaven another question is um who will be taken up in rapture and i think we discussed this john asked this in the previous lecture lecture, le lecture. uh you know uh and so you know we, we, we you know will there be people left behind and so on and and so we talk you know there is the parable of the ten virgins and the ten talents and and uh, and so on so here again i kind of emphasize you know what what i've shared already that is salvation is is a gift these these exhortations are given to us for us to live ready Right? live ready in the state of readiness but salvation is a gift so we have to hold both truths together we can't take one and discard the other so if salvation is a gift it is always a gift but we have to live in readiness you have to live in readiness so take both together and we cannot we should not say that you know if you are saved as a believer you're just going to left be left behind arbitrarily no Everybody who is saved by grace is going to be raptured. And yes, we know that we will all be in different levels of maturity. Some may have been saved, you know, five minutes before the rapture. Some may have been saved 50 years before the rapture. But, you know, whatever happens at that moment, if you are in Christ, you're saved by grace through faith, you are saved. And being part of the rapture is included in salvation. Another question is, uh, Will we recognize each other in heaven? And the answer is yes. You know, we, how do we know it? Well, we see some examples uh, in on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Moses and Elijah appeared along with Jesus. Now, Peter, James, and John, who were there on the Mount of Transfiguration, they had never seen uh, Moses and Elijah, and they didn't have, you know. Uh, pictures by which they could identify oh that's Moses that's Elijah no they didn't have all that but somehow they knew that's Moses that's Elijah talking to Jesus they just knew how did they know Paul says that in heaven we will know even as we are known that means there is this knowledge that that's given to every person to know about the things of God so we will recognize each other in heaven and uh, it is some it's a knowledge that given to us so we've never we, we would we've never seen any of these old testament sayings or bible characters but we will know who each one is you will recognize each other okay so let me pause here any questions so far
any other questions you would like to ask about the rapture and anything connected to it? Okay. Let's go forward. So remember, um, we mentioned about Daniel's 70th week, right? So I want to just explain that a little bit because that puts the book of Revelation in context. And then after that, we will get into Revelation chronologically. So let's go now to Daniel chapter 9, please. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. Daniel chapter 9. And uh, we're going to read verses 24 to 27. Daniel 9, Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. Now let's give a little background to these verses. Daniel um, was a man who, of course, we know as a Jewish young man, he was uh, taken captive um, by the Babylonians into Babylon. Right, so he was taken as a captive, and uh, let's put my bookmark here. Right, so he served under King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he served as part of the Babylonian kingdom. Then King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, was the last Babylonian king. Belshazzar was killed, and the Medes took over. That's another empire, the Medes. King Darius was the first leader there of the Medes. But the Medes were overthrown, and then the Persians took over. King Cyrus was the first of the Persian kings. Then came after the Persians, the Greeks came, and so on. And after the Greeks, the Romans. So that's the history. Daniel served during the Babylonians, during the Medes, and during the Persians. So during the Babylonian time, God gave him many visions. God gave many visions, and he had recorded that for us. He, you know, he interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter two. He had a vision uh, during the time of Belshazzar. Uh, that's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Uh, he shares that with us in chapter seven, and also in chapter eight. Chapter nine, Daniel chapter nine, where we are right now, is. Is Daniel's experience during the time of Darius. Darius was the first Mede king. Right? The Medes took over from the Babylonians. So Darius was king at that time. And um, during his reign, Daniel had this experience of chapter 9. So in chapter 9, Daniel is praying for his people. Uh, he realizes that Jeremiah said, you know, um, the people of Israel would be in captivity 70 years and then they would come back. So Daniel is praying about that prophecy, saying, God, you know, 70 years is almost over. We need to go back. And during that time, Gabriel appears to Daniel and he gives him this understanding about the end times. So let's read Daniel chapter 9. Somebody could read verses 24 to 27, please. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal a vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore the build Jerusalem, restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off 
but not for his not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary the end of it shall be with a flood and till the end of the war desolations are determined then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate okay thank you so the angel gabriel is speaking to daniel and he he explains to daniel what is going to happen right so let's look at it verse by verse daniel 9 verse 24 he says gabriel tells daniel 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city now he's saying daniel i've come to talk to you about 70 weeks and these 70 weeks are specific to your people that is israel jewish people and your city your holy city jerusalem now i mentioned earlier that we know 70 weeks one week represents seven years uh, we know it from uh, in any cross reference you can see genesis 29 27 and 28 where in the ancient hebrew uh, a week represents seven years right that's how they used it so what gabriel is saying is daniel i've come to talk to you about 490 years 70 weeks right? or 70 times 7 490 years i've come to talk to you about 490 years and all these 490 years speak specifically about your people and your holy city and then gabriel says this is what is going to happen during these 490 years he gives two sets of things first he says to finish transgression to make an end of sins to make reconciliation for iniquity the first part sin transgression iniquity is going to be dealt with right that means it's this this matter is going to be dealt with transgression sins iniquity secondly he says to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy the second set of things that are going to happen is everlasting righteousness will be introduced will be ushered in vision and prophecy will be fulfilled and the most holy one will be anointed you know so appointed as king so that we, we understand as the millennium because the millennium is the time when righteousness will be ushered in prophecies fulfilled and jesus christ is anointed to rule and reign the first part to make an end of transgression iniquity and sin that's jesus christ dying for us on the cross right so 490 years two big things are going to take place first iniquity transgression sin is going to be dealt with jesus will die on the cross second righteousness will be ushered in prophecy will be fulfilled and the most holy jesus will be anointed set as king so in this 490 years okay but how is this going to happen verse 25 know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build jerusalem until messiah the prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks seven plus 62 is 69 right so 69 weeks seven plus 62 the street will be built again and the wall even in trouble sometimes so he's saying daniel from the time the command is given to go and rebuild jerusalem now that was going to happen right 
Remember, Daniel was, this was the time of King Darius, the Mede. After him, he, the Medes will be overthrown. The Persians will come. King Cyrus, the first Persian king, he is the one who gave the order, go back and rebuild Jerusalem. So what did Gabriel say? From the time King Cyrus gives this order, till the Messiah comes, Jesus comes, will be 69 weeks, that is 69 times 7, 483 years. And that's exactly what happened. Right? 483 years from, Messiah, from Cyrus giving a decree to go and rebuild Jerusalem till Jesus came. Now, of course, when they rebuild Jerusalem, like he says here in the end of verse 25, the street will be built again and the wall. So the city was rebuilt, but in difficult times. So the streets were rebuilt, the wall was rebuilt. Nehemiah came and rebuilt the wall. The temple was rebuilt, but it was rebuilt in difficult times. Then verse 26, after 62 weeks, that means at the end of the 483 years, 7 plus 62. At the end of the 62, that means totally 69 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Jesus will be crucified, but not for himself. So he didn't die for himself. He died for everybody else. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after Jesus died, the city was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. By whom? The people of the prince who was to come. That means the Romans. So uh, the general Titus, a Roman general, he destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Okay. So they will destroy the city and sanctuary. The end of it will be with a flood. And till the end of war, desolations are determined. That means from the time of the destruct, destruction of the city and the sanctuary on till the end of war, there is going to be desolation. So that means there's, this city is going to experience a lot of trouble. Jerusalem is going to experience a lot of trouble till war can cease, which is the beginning of the millennium. So, which is true. From the time of the Romans on till now, Jerusalem is experiencing desolation, is experiencing war and trouble. That's going on. Then verse 27. Now, we are picking up verse 27 without context, but in chapter 7 and chapter 8, Daniel has had visions about the Antichrist. He, had, he has had visions about the little horn, this man who will speak blasphemous things against God. Right. So he's already seen all that. So now verse 27 is in connection with that. He says, then he, that is this little horn, this man of sin, this Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one week. So he's saying, Daniel, see, 69 weeks, 483 years, from the time Cyrus gives the issue to go back to Jerusalem till Jesus comes for 83 years. Then there is a long gap, almost 2,000 years, long gap. The war and desolation will continue. Then this man will come for the final week. That's Daniel's 70th week. This man will come. The Antichrist will come for this final week. All right. So 69 weeks plus one week, Daniel's 70th week. And what will happen in this Daniel's 70th week? This man will come. And he will sign a peace treaty. He'll confirm a covenant. I'm looking at verse 27 for one week. So the 70th week is when the Antichrist is operating. And what will he do? In the middle of the week, that means after three and a half years, he will stop the sacrifice. He will, that means the temple will be rebuilt and there will be sacrifices happening. He will stop it. And on the wings of abomination. Wings of abomination means he is moving very fast to do evil, abomination before God. He will be the one who makes desolate. He is going to bring utter destruction. Okay. And until the consummation, till that seven, that seven week 
is going to lead up to the consummation, the final judgment. God, Christ is going to come, and there's going to be the consummation of everything. So, what is Daniel 70th week? It's just one week that is still pending. And it's that one week the Antichrist is going to operate. And that's what Paul the Apostle in 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2 was referring to, the man of sin, the perdition who's going to set himself up in the temple of God. All that is revealed in the book of Daniel. We're only looking at Daniel chapter 9. But what I want us to understand is, what is spoken of in Daniel 9.27, this one week, that is the tribulation week. That is Daniel's 70th week. That is what a, much of the book of Revelation is talking about, the details. Okay, so next week we're going to start going through Revelation chronologically and see all of these things unfold. So, did everybody understand Daniel chapter 9? Okay, uh, I see John's question. The flood mentioned in 26. Yeah, so it is uh, it, literally there was not a flood when, when, when Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, at that time, they say that okay, there was there was a fire, and uh, so obviously to put out the fire and all of that, there was the flood. Um, so there was not flood in the sense of you know like a overflow of a river and submerging a city or something like that. But when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was at that time the Emperor Titus. There, the, you know, the destruction happened. In, in that manner. So it could refer to that, or it could just refer to something that overwhelms the city uh, in a symbolic way. right? But historically, there was no big flood that submerged Jerusalem in that sense. Right? Okay. But it's talking about how the city was overwhelmed, overthrown. And until the end of war, there will be desolations on that city. It'll be, you know, really disrupted and troubled until the end of war, which will happen in Revelation 19. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? OK. So I hope you're following uh, me. Uh, I hope it's not too difficult to understand these things. Uh, it, it is quite amazing, actually. Uh, when you look at scripture and uh, look at Bible prophecy, how beautiful it is. Um, let's take a moment to pray and we'll close. Could somebody pray, close, and dismiss the class, please? Well, we thank you for this time of learning. We thank you for your prom promises, the words that you have spoken long back which is being fulfilled even today god we want to thank you for uh, the assurance that you have given us uh, and the beautiful privilege that you have given us to be known by you lord we pray that we would continue to learn about your coming and the end of times and we would prepare ourselves to meet with you and also to spread this word to people around us god we thank you for this time in jesus name we pray amen amen Thank you so much, everyone. We'll uh, continue this next week. God bless. Bye now.